G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy for another trade update. The season is officially over. Um, I'm not going to only make trade and draft content from this point. I've got uh, a season review for each team coming out. Uh, the, the, that is the finalists. I've already done one for all the teams that miss finals. And uh, I'm also going to do a video soon reacting to my ladder prediction at the start of the year. That, that should be good fun. So stay tuned for that. But um, as we get through this period between now and the end of the trade period, the trade news we're getting is just about daily. So make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any of it and we'll crack into it. So there's a bit going on today. Some some juicy little rumors popping up around some players that had previously gone quiet. Uh, but we'll start with the fact that we now know the destination of Harry Perriman. So as you would have probably seen by now, he has nominated Collingwood. The circumstances around this are kind of interesting because all year he was linked to Port Adelaide and Hawthorne. He was choosing between either of those clubs. I think he's New South Wales originally, or a New South Welshman, I should say. Um, so there was no go home factor as such. It's probably about, you know, naturally money and opportunity. Port Adelaide had the bigger contract offer. Hawthorne are just such an attractive destination that they were also considered a major contender for him. But in recent days, Collingwood really ramped up their pursuit of Harry Perryman, which kind of led me to think, well, why weren't they really looking at him too hard before? I don't know. My personal take is Collingwood really should have been looking at the free agency market this year. And I think they had a little bit of a dip at Josh Battle. Now they're going for Perryman. And just like that, he's pretty much committed to them. So he has nominated them officially for six years. His contract is going to be worth. And there's a bit to play out about whether it will be band one or band two. We'll get to that in a moment. But this seems to be born out of his love for Collingwood, which is kind of fascinating. I didn't think that happened too much in footy, where players choose their boyhood club. In fact, I've seen plenty of opposite examples. Uh, certainly in Western Australia, Elliot Yeo chose to go to West Coast over Fremantle for whatever reason at the time. I think Fremantle were the better team around that 2013 era as well, and he chose West Coast despite growing up a Fremantle fan. So that's just the inverse example. But either way, I mean, I suppose it's kind of nice. I, I, it says here he wore number 36 at GWS because he loved Dane Swan. So I suppose Collingwood was always is going to be difficult to beat out for this but they've got him and I think this is a really good signing for Collingwood I think looking at their list transition over the next few years tons of veterans not a whole heap of draft capital they needed to do something in the free agency market and Perryman is a good underrated player however one thing that's interesting is that there's a chance this goes as band one compensation. Now, that would mean that the contract he's being offered is over $900,000 per year. So we know that there's going to be inflated contracts over the coming years with CBA, the CBA rising and the salary cap rising. And I say inflated compared to current expectations. So band one or band two compensation is obviously tied to what compensation GWS get in terms of their draft pick. So to be clear... Band one is after that team's first pick. Band two is at the end of the first round. So what that works out to be is it could either be pick 15 that goes to the Giants or pick 19. I believe the AFL has also confirmed as well that band two compensations will come before North Melbourne's priority picks. If you've forgotten, North Melbourne got a, a bunch of priority picks that they could trade to other clubs. They now belong to Sydney and the Gold Coast Suns. So that means band two compensation picks will come before that, which is very relevant for those following the draft. So it's a four pick slide for GWS, whether it's band one or band two. But as a side note, it's kind of interesting. Look, I like Harry Perriman, good player. And I understand that the compensation is measured on, on the new contract rather than the previous contract or his value to the old club. But if we're talking about band one compensation, for me, that should really be one of the most important players at the club that he is leaving. Is Harry Perriman in GWS's five, six, seven best players? I'm not too sure that is the case. He is a good player. He's a good player. But if this goes as band one compensation, it's uh, it's interesting. I'm not harping on it too much. We're really talking about pick 15 or pick 19. So in, in effect, it doesn't really matter. So before we move on to the other trade deals, we'll cover off some of the, the free agency deals that seem to be locked in, basically. So Perryman to the Pies, Isaac Cumming nominated Adelaide. We've also got new confirmation that Nick Haynes has nominated Carlton officially. So that's another free agency move that will happen pretty soon, you'd think. Jack Graham has nominated West Coast. Josh Battle has nominated Hawthorne as well. So on Battle, that one will be also interesting whether that's band one compensation because St Kilda, that means pick eight. If it's band two, it could potentially be pick 19 or 20. So there's going to be all these knock-on effects of these band one, two, three compensation picks pushing back teams in the draft. You'd imagine Nick Haynes won't get too much of a compensation pick because of his age and you know the size of his contract. Jack Graham probably more modest, probably middle of the draft. But Battle coming in Perryman probably all impact the top 
25, 30 picks. On that note, with uh, Andrew McAlter being announced as the new West Coast Eagles coach, uh, we've seen a couple of formal requests to get there now. Liam Baker has nominated the Eagles as his preferred destination. We will never know truly if it depended on McAlter being coach. Obviously, there's a relationship there as to whether Baker chose West Coast. There was already reason to go home, you know, like West Australian trying to get home. It was always going to be West Coast or Fremantle. As for Jack Graham, that one might be more dependent on McWalter having been announced as coach, given he is South Australian. But both players now are likely to get to West Coast. Jack Graham probably first, because it doesn't need to be a trade. It's a free agency move. And Liam Baker, that's just a matter of the clubs negotiating during trade periods. So that is a new update. As for the Dan Houston one, we've probably got it down to two clubs from what I'm reading. I think Channel 9 reported that Collingwood are out of the race for him. I presume this has got something to do with Perryman, you'd think, because there is some degree of similarity between those players. Halfback sort of wing type operators who could potentially roll through the midfield. I, th- I suppose Collingwood thought, well, we've got Perryman. We don't need to formulate a trade for Dan Houston. So it's Carlton and North Melbourne. So interestingly as well, I read that Port Adelaide are furious with Carlton's arrogance amid indirect trade talks for Dan Houston. So from what I can gather, they've only spoken through Houston's management. The two clubs have actually not sat down to have a chat about this negotiation just yet. So the mock trade that is being projected, the the, the projected basing on what Carlton is offering, is a first round pick from a third club, unnamed, but possibly Gold Coast, because they don't have a need for their first round draft pick this year as such. So we're talking about pick 12 there, which again has a number of clubs circling. So could it be pick 12 in this year's draft? Carlton retained their own pick, but they're also saying Matt Owies goes to Port Adelaide. So let's call it pick 12 and Matt Owies to Port Adelaide. Carlton get Dan Houston and third club, potentially Gold Coast in this scenario, get Carlton's future first round selection, which will help with more academy players they get next year. So quoting Edmund, he says, they, Carlton, are saying, we're keeping pick 11. We need to take it to a strong draft this year. But what we'll do is we'll trade our future first round pick to a third club, whether it be Gold Coast or Richmond, They have abundance of them this year and no need for them. So I suppose the power are pretty unsatisfied with this, if you you believe what Sam Edmund says. We do know in the background, North Melbourne could be a major contender here because if they are willing to offer a juicy deal to Port Adelaide, that could be in the way of a future first round draft pick as has previously been speculated. That might be enough to turn Port Adelaide's head. Yes, it's not in the super current draft that's right in front of them right now, but it could still be pick two, three in next year's draft, depending on your views of North Melbourne's trajectory. So a bit to play out there. It does seem like there's Carlton and North Melbourne, although Sam Edmund says you can't rule out Melbourne just yet. So maybe there's maybe there's a little bit more to play out. Speaking of Matt Owies, uh, we have now seen him linked to Melbourne for the first time. This is the first time I've seen it. He's 27, uncontracted. I said in my previous update, linked to a bunch of non-Victorian clubs. I think the two Queensland clubs, uh, Port Adelaide, of course, we just spoke about. West Coast even met with him apparently. Um, North Melbourne had a dip. So Melbourne have now entered that race. So it's similar to James Peatling. We're getting like this massive group cluster of clubs still circulating around a player who has not found a home yet. I suppose in most instances, Clubs have a good idea that players have a specific club in mind, whereas with Peatling and Owies, it's still so open-ended. We don't actually know Peatling's leaving yet. I will note as well, I'll pass on that on SEN, Sam Edmund didn't rule out Cozzy Pickett still leaving. So he says, don't dismiss the possibility of a Kaiseya Pickett move. So again, this one sort of bobbed up a few weeks ago. He might go to Western Australia. He was drafted out of South Australia, but connections, family connections in Western Australia, bit of a link to Fremantle there. This one, I uh, just... He's contracted for a start, but there's so much going on with the West Australian clubs right now that I just cannot see a scenario where even Fremantle, who are likely to be more aggressive and and probably won't get Liam Baker now, would they go all out to get Cozzy Pickett and Shea Bolton? Bearing in mind the opportunity cost could be, you know, salary to get Chad Water next year. I don't know exactly where that sits. Maybe they can afford all three of them. But for me, I I I think it's so difficult to see how this gets done. Um, And Melbourne, you know, in recent times have shown a tendency to hold players to their contract, particularly big ones like Clayton Oliver. Should we talk about Clayton Oliver? Well, there's not too much to say other than his name has resurfaced once again this trade period, which I kind of saw coming. Um, You know, it first came up last trade period. I remember doing a video on that and the clubs linked to him were Adelaide, St Kilda and Geelong and I believe Essendon were as well. This article doesn't say Essendon, but I remember talking about Essendon. So there's no specific links. However, I think there's a suggestion that his name could be at least targeted by opposition clubs. And it got me thinking, I was like, can you imagine if Geelong end up with Clayton Oliver 
and Bailey Smith. Two players that are absolute guns. I think back to 2021, that final series, well, that grand final in particular as well. And they both end up at Geelong. And, you know, I don't know what sort of discount they get on both of them, but both of them have been probably off their best for a couple of years now for different reasons. I really hope he doesn't go to Geelong. I, I, I have no issue with you, Geelong, but you can understand why I just don't want to see you guys get Clayton Oliver and Bailey Smith. I mentioned Gold Coast pick 12 earlier. This one could be on the move. So to clarify, Gold Coast have six and 12 and 20. Six probably going to Richmond for Rioli, we think. 12 is the one that can probably trade for value in next year's draft, considering they've got their academy player. I don't want to repeat myself, but I do want to make it clear that that's what we're talking about. So I'll just pass on that to me, says that Carlton, Collingwood, North Melbourne, and Melbourne now have interest in the pick, as well as GWS and Adelaide. So what this is going to probably look like is trading collateral in next year's draft for these clubs to try and get into this year's draft. It's pretty hard to map out how all these clubs get it done. It's probably worth a video in itself. Uh, Carlton, we know that that could be linked to a Dan Houston move. Collingwood has probably been embroiled with that, with the John Noble trade potentially, and they've got their own future father-son. North Melbourne, well, they probably want to look at some talls. The Demons probably having one eye on the draft, particularly with this one being a strong one. Um, GWS and Adelaide, yeah, I guess, I suppose same thing. I will note here that Hardwick did explicitly say they're looking to bring in established talent. And we probably already know that given John Noble and Daniel Rioli are likely to get there. But he says we had four first round picks last year, so we don't need to keep having first, uh, first round picks. So not really headline news there, but just interesting to show that Hardwick is clearly of the mindset that it's time to target and top up for the now, which makes perfect sense. I want to talk a little bit about Chad Warner because I got mocked for even discussing the possibility of this on a recent video. So the, the update here is, if, if you missed the first bit, this sort of came to the fore when Will Schofield did a video, or named a podcast on the Backchat Studios YouTube channel. He named it, If Sydney Win the Flag, Chad Warner will go to West Coast. So I made a video reacting to that, and then I think I included it in a trade update last week, and was told by quite a few people that I was dreaming, as though I was the one who made it up. However, not to be too much of a smug dick about it, but I, I will just say that John Ralph is now running with his story. So he's saying that WA clubs are of the belief it is his intention to return home at the end of next year. Again, that, that's probably been bubbling away from a little while. That is actually separate to what Will Schofield said. That has actually been a theory in the West for some time now. Ralph says he's stubborn enough to believe he can get through a whole season of a contract impasse. They believe it's not an ambit claim, it's not a contract negotiation. So he is genuinely keen to get home because he and his partner, who is also from Perth, just want to go home. Ralph says they even believe that if Sydney had won this game, he might have put in a trade request. Okay, so there's just increasing evidence now that it wasn't completely made up. Tom Morris weighed in and he says, I think there is going to be massive money offered to Chad Warner. I'm talking 10, 12, 14 million dollars across 9, 10 or 11 years. I don't know if that's just opinion, but that is absurd. However, he does say the go home factor is real and even more real than the money is offered. So I think we can accept that there's a good chance Chad Warner goes home in 12 months. Now, would he have gone home if Sydney had won the flag? We'll never truly know, but Ralph does say, say that that was the distinct possibility. However, it's very, very unlikely he moves this year. Not impossible, because crazy things do happen during trade period, but that is something to consider, and imagine there's going to be quite the war between the two WA clubs in 12 months from now. And finally, just a, a little tidbit on Jack Stringer. Um, this one has a little bit of an update where GWS is now linked to a potential move for him. So Sydney's name popped up and then went away. And then Collingwood's name popped up and has been, you know, ruled a line through. Jake Stringer has a contract uh, based on a trigger extension with Essendon for one more year, if you've missed it. And GWS is now considering a move for him. So that's interesting. I suppose part of their motivation is looking at how many players are leaving GWS this year. You know, Cumming, Perriman, Haynes, potentially Pete Ling. I'm probably forgetting someone as well. So string it in, um, probably just a little bit of mature depth. It's already a pretty dangerous forward line, let's be real. So he could add something, I guess a different spark to what they've already got there. Anyway, guys, that is my trade update. Some interesting narratives going on at the same time with only one real or one or two real updates. So we had a, a formal trade request from Liam Baker and I suppose Jack Graham through free agency and Harry Perryman has selected Collingwood and a lot of the other stuff is just new stuff bobbing up or a little bit of context around other deals. There's so much to play out and I'm looking forward to it. It's a great time of the year. So thanks for watching. Make sure you subscribe. I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.